time. We have our guest for today on the line, and it is Michael Spurlock, former Dallas Cowboys assistant coach, uh, former Ole Miss player. Now he works down at Ole Miss as well in recruiting. Uh, Michael, you got John Schmuck and Lance Meadow up here in New York for the New York Football Giants. Thanks so much for the time today. We hope you and your family are very safe in these uh, very turbulent times in our country. Good morning. Uh, we are safe. Um, I'm in the great state of Mississippi. I'm up in Oxford, and uh, I'm glad to be here. I hope you all are safe as well. Yes, we are, Michael. Thank you very much. And, of course, the news that broke uh, just a couple days ago, Ole Miss going to uh, retire Eli Manning's number. You were a teammate of Eli. You backed him up at quarterback down there. Uh, we're very familiar with Eli Manning, the pro. I started working with the Giants in 2007. I've known Eli a really long time. But I don't know what Eli Manning, the college man, was like. Tell us about it. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think he he has grown up. Uh, I would say the first time I met Eli, um, he's kind of quirkish. He's very quiet. But once you get to know him, he's a big practical joker. Uh, he loves to have a good time. But um, I used to laugh because he used to always sit in the meeting room and just kind of look through the media guy. But uh, he's, he's such a competitor that, come to find out, he's looking at all the records, you know, um, because he is that big of a competitor. You know, his dad played here, and um, he's just one of those guys that he wants to find an edge in everything that he does, and that's why he was able to play as long as he did. Um, he was looking for his edge, and every day just trying to figure out ways to get better and ways to just implement himself and – uh, that's what he's done. I mean, uh, they retired his number because of the great work that he's done as a player, as a man. And, uh, I mean, uh, that was an opportunity for myself being able to come here. And, you know, they always say, well, why would you want to go to Ole Miss and Eli's there? But I had the opportunity to compete with a guy who became a great friend of mine. And, uh, I mean, he became the number one draft pick of that um of his draft class and I got to be around him every day for three years and just watch how he competed and how he carried himself and uh, it was a blast Michael you brought up the fact that he's a prankster and I think anybody that has been a teammate of his with the New York Giants probably has at least one story maybe multiple stories in which they were either on the wrong side or maybe the right side of the prank is there any instance that stands out to you from your years with him at Ole Miss in which he got you or somebody else got him? Um, well, I can tell you one story, uh, and the story that other stories I could tell you, they would not be good for on air because uh, <laughs> it, it's no limit to um, his pranks. I mean, oh, yeah. like I say, he's a competitor. He's going to find a way to get you, but uh, so – it was me and another guy by the name of Seth Smith who were freshmen. We came in together. Well, Eli goes to the uh, Playboy. Um, he's a Playboy All-American. Well, he got these slippers that, I mean, I never thought he loved anything more, but he got these slippers, and one of our quarterbacks, Seth Smith, took the slippers, and, I mean, we were in training camp. He hid them, I know, for like two, three weeks. And Eli was just like, look, I quit. Like, just bring my slippers back. You know, uh, it was a great accomplishment. Well, Eli, being Eli, he never really lets anything go. So, during that time, uh, in training camp, everybody had their own personal water bottle. And so, at, at every break, they open up the cooler, your name is on it, you pick it up. And, I mean, you're in Mississippi, you are anything cold and wet you ready to drink it well <laughs> we all tired everybody get their water bottle oh, well no. what he did with Seth Smith is he emptied all the Gatorade out of his water bottle and just put water and soap in there so <laughs> like I said we're all tired and everybody's squeezing he squeezes and nothing but soap and everything goes in his mouth <laughs> and Eli is like killing himself laughing and we like come on man but the the slippers is what kind of like alright I quit it's no more pranks Hey, bye guns, we bye guns, we're done. But, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, that's just Eli. Eli had the opportunity to be around him and David Morris, and I think they went back at it more than anybody. Uh, you just, you just with Eli, you're always on guard. If he's saying something, uh, and he always talks with his hands, so you just got to watch him always. Tell us about Eli Manning, the player at Ole Miss. What made him special 
that allowed him to succeed the way that he did in the pros? Um, you know, it was funny because a lot of people, they look at him in the pros and look at him where uh, he, he doesn't seem like this type of person. He doesn't seem like that. Eli, um, I think, is because of who he is and because of his name, a lot of people want stuff from you, you know, and uh, that's one thing. You, you come in and play after your father and your man in name and uh, Peyton did so well. So I think he had to be guarded because you never know, okay, how is this going to look? Uh, everything that he says is going to – it can easily be twisted. But him as a competitor – um, I think that's the way that he approached the game, that he always looked at every angle. Um, he always studied and just felt like, okay, I want to compete, but I want to do it at another level. You know, um, the things that I think that he did well was, and I laugh when I watch the games because we were always throwing one up, but he would always every now and then just throw the ball left hand. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, why, why are you throwing the ball left hand? That doesn't make sense. But if you're watching games, he, he will be about to get sacked. Yes, he did. And he'll put the ball in his other hand, and he was comfortable enough with it that he could at least get the ball off to throw it away or get it to somebody. And you think, like, well, that's that's stupid to do. But every second of the day, he was thinking of a way to get better. To you, it might look like, okay, this is meaningless, it's wasteful, but, I mean, just watching him in, meeting, in meetings, he will watch so much to where, okay, watch this D-lineman's hand. Uh, I remember this play, this guy throws the ball. Watch how this ball hits this person in the crowd. Like, everything was so meticulous about him, and I think that's what made him who he is and why he was able to play the game so long. Uh, I mean, he's not the most athletic guy, but he finds a way to get away from the rush. Uh, he threw the ball probably – better than a lot of people uh and one thing that he always i thought he did a really good job he always had a tight end that he loved and he always had a star receiver that no matter what i'm gonna get your opportunity to catch this ball i just need you to you know give me everything you got don't let them catch it and you know everybody talk about intercession this and that i think he competed that way and you know yeah maybe sometime it went it didn't the ball didn't bounce his way, but he competed it until you say, you know what, my time is up, and uh, I mean that's why we're talking about him right now. Absolutely, his attention to detail certainly transferred over to his tenure with the Giants. There's no doubt about that. And Michael, the other interesting connection in terms of the Giants and Ole Miss. Your head coach was David Cutcliffe, and interestingly, he's now the head coach at Duke and helped mentor Daniel Jones, who is the current quarterback of the Giants. What was your experience like being around David Cutcliffe and seeing what he did to help groom Eli as well as yourself and then what we saw him do with Daniel Jones? What is it specifically that goes on in that film room, that quarterback room, that has made him produce a variety of different successful QBs? Um, I just think he, he's very meticulous. Um, he's very demanding. Uh, you're going to enjoy it, but it's going to be some times in there that y'all not going to like each other because, um, <laughs> and I mean, the proof is in the pudding. And what I mean by that is you can go look at his resume. He's been able to produce quarterbacks and the way he's done it, um, and that's been his way. He, he's looking at the way you throw the ball, how you hold it, where it, where is it being held, where are you releasing it at. He breaks you down to the point of, uh, it's almost like the army breaks you down to build you back up into what you become. And, you know, talent is one thing, but when talent leaves you, uh, your, your work ethic and your fundamentals, he makes sure to build those things up to where, um, I, I think they're second to none. And I mean, you just keep looking at quarterback after quarterback. He's done it. Uh, I mean, I'm probably one of the lesser quarterbacks. He can take credit for it, but, I mean, you look at Eli, you look at Daniel Jones. Uh, I mean, he had uh, T. Martin. Uh, he has Peyton. You know, the list goes on and on. And I just think he's a he's a guy that he wants you to have a plan A is this is what I'm going to do now when it's plan B. What is your plan B? And I think he helps you move through those, uh, those answers so quickly to where when you're playing the game, you've seen all the looks. Every now and then they give you looks that you hadn't seen, but I mean he makes you study film to the point where it's all like it's like deja vu, like you've done it already. Now you're just really acting it out. 
We're joined by Michael Spurlock, current senior player personnel analyst for the Ole Miss Rebels. Played for the Ole Miss Rebels with Eli Manning. Had a nine-year NFL career. Was an assistant coach with the Cowboys in 2016 under Jason Garrett. And we'll get to that in a second. You know, Michael, you had a real long career in the league. You played nine different years with a bunch of different teams. You were an excellent return man. Uh, on special teams. So you had to go from team to team here and, and learn different offenses and, you know, figure things out as you went. What do you think it's going to be like for NFL players this year with no offseason program, no on-field work, trying to get ready for a season when they're just showing up in for, for training camp end of July and they're getting on the field, at least in the Giants' case, with brand new coaches, brand new offense, brand new defense for the first time. What's going to be the biggest challenge, you think, uh, for these players as they go through this offseason? Um. You know, it's funny, we were just talking about that this morning. Uh, you know, Kevin Smith is here with us, and we were just talking about, you know, what does it feel like? To me, it feels like the lockout, you know. Yeah. Um, everybody was kind of doing their own thing. You didn't know if you had football. You didn't know. Uh, I think the thing that they have the leg up on is the Zoom meetings. And uh, I think the NFL is more has gone more to above the neck than, your talent, I think your talent takes over, but you got to know what to do. And uh, I think it's, I think the way things are built now, it plays in the hand of the veterans because the veterans know what to expect. Um, the rookies, I think, are going to have a hard time because the reps are going to be uh, very, I mean, really cut down to nothing. Um, it's going to be really who, who can really pick up the offense the fastest without the reps and. Um, I think it's going to be tough for guys, you know, a guy like me right now to make a team, I think it would be hard because you're not going to get as many opportunities. So every opportunity that you do get to show is going to have to be like dang near perfect. And that's, uh, you're almost asking for, it's unrealistic. So I think it's going to be tough for those guys. I think it's going to be a lot better for the veteran guys. A lot of guys that were probably, uh, on the cusp of being cut or, probably, okay, let's see how they do if they're going to make the team. I think they're going to be able to make it because, one, they know what to expect. Then the other thing, they know what to expect as far as plays are not that much different. It's just you might call your play red, I might call my play two, and the other person might call their play two red. It's just now how does that language translate? But, uh, I mean, it's it's an unknown time right now, um, and I, I really – I really hope football is played because I think it is a great sport, and I think we need football as Americans. It's uh, it's a it's something that uh, get, brings everybody together, uh, especially in this time. But I mean, it's 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 scary for a guy that you know all he wanted to do was make it to the NFL and get that opportunity. Uh, his window is you know kind of closing quickly here, so hopefully those guys have been on those Zoom meetings and preparing and being ready once the the, they roll the ball out there and say, hey, let's go. They're, they, they're in shape, but mentally they're more in shape than anything. Michael, it's interesting you brought up the lockout. As you mentioned, you were in the league. You were with the Bucks. Well, Jason Garrett, who is now the Giants offensive coordinator, he was the Cowboys head coach at the time. So he has experience in terms of going through that uncharted territory. And John mentioned you were a member of the 2016 Cowboys coaching staff. Also, people may forget you were briefly on the Cowboys in 2013 as <laughs> yeah. a player when Garrett was the head coach. So you've been exposed to Garrett as a player as well as an assistant what you yep. saw with Garrett in 2016 and him helping develop Dak Prescott and now him having the opportunity to work with a young quarterback like Daniel Jones, what similarities do you think could apply from what happened in 16 to now the challenge at hand here in 20 with Daniel Jones? Well, I, um, it, it was fortunate for me. and I mean, I count my blessings because I had the opportunity to – watch it, you know, kind of behind the scenes. Uh, I thought he did a very good job building a relationship with Dak Prescott. Um, I think he was very personable as well as he had played the position and he knew the ins and outs of, one, not only the offense, but what a young QB goes through. Um, and I think he really spent time, I mean, him and Dak were warm up together, him and Dak, uh, would just do little things where it kind of brought the wall down. Because when you're the head coach, nobody really wants to deal with the head coach because it's like the principal. 
you know, when you go see the principal, normally you're in trouble. So I think <laughs> Jason Garrett did a really good job of bringing those walls down because, I mean, it was very um, – it was a sensitive time. Tony Romo was the quarterback. Unfortunately, he gets hurt. Uh, you got a rookie quarterback in that, I mean, we're, we're pretty set up to, like, if everything goes well, playoff, Super Bowl, this is a big year. Um, now you got a rookie quarterback. I thought he did a really good job of really kind of taking the pressure off of him and say, okay, I'm going to push you and not leave you to where where I'm going to make you handicap. But at the same time, I'm going to keep you in a comfort zone to where, okay, you showing me that you can take this on, I'm going to put a little more on your plate. And I thought he did a really good job of that, uh, making Dak feel comfortable. I think he would do the same thing with Daniel Jones. Uh, the thing that I think Daniel Jones does have is he has a year up under his belt to where he kind of knows what to expect now. It's more so this is his team. Uh, you know, um, Jason Garrett, if I'm not mistaken, he played with the Giants. So yep, he's yep. familiar with the New York uh, um, the industry and being up there. So he can kind of take, hey, make sure that you stay out of – because New York is – I mean, it's prime time. Anything goes on, you're going to be on the front page. Take that away. I think he's going to eat up his time to where he's going to push him to be better in everything he does. And uh, they used to play a little game where, you know, one to the face and one to the body, uh, you get certain points about accuracy. It, it seems like a simple game, but they did it competing. And it's also, it shows you, it brings some naturalness out of, you know, where, okay, well, I'm I'm the starting quarterback. I got to act a certain way. Well, with Dak, he made Dak feel like he was back at Mississippi State. I think he's going to make Daniel Jones feel like he's back at Duke. Uh, unfortunately, you know, it is going to be a short time, and they're going to hit the ground running. But I'm sure uh, if I know Coach Garrett, he's had him on Zoom meetings <laughs> over and over, whatever the time is allotted. I'm sure he's maxed that out to make sure that, they have a relationship like none other to where when they do get in the building together, I mean, it's going to be like they've been together all offseason. Michael, final question for me. I want to bring it back to Eli for a second. He's going to get his number retired, as I mentioned, at Ole Miss. And you mentioned a couple times how Archie Manning went there. Peyton specifically went to Tennessee, so he didn't have that kind of shadow over his head, right? It just seems, from what I know about Eli, that he has the perfect personality to deal with something like that because nothing bothers him. He kind of just goes, you know, easy e. That, that's everyone kind of called him up here. He's always cool. Nothing ever bothers him. Did you ever see Eli Manning in your time at Ole Miss ever get rattled, or was he always this calm guy that just took everything in stride? No, I, um, I think Eli has always taken, and again, this is for my years been around. Uh, I really never saw him rattle like. I, and I don't know, I, I would say, you know, growing up having the NFL father, um, being around football, your brother being um, really good, and you kind of just watching it, I think when you kind of the baby boy, you I'm the youngest of three boys, so you kind of watch everybody else and you just kind of take, okay, well, he did that and that was good, I'm going to take that. He did that, that wasn't so good. Uh, how can I make that better? Uh, the thing that I think that helped him, Peyton would come up, uh, I want to say maybe the first two years I was here, he would come up in the spring and work with us like he was a college player, you know, and just really detailing things out. And I think Eli just had such a – his personality, but I think the groundwork was kind of laid in front of him, and I think he just picked the ball up when it was his turn. And, uh, I mean, when you're playing quarterback, you really can't let people see you sweat. And, you know, I think it pisses a lot of people off because he's always easy, you know. Uh, he's always E-man. So when he's in the uh, – when they're interviewing him and, you know, he might not have played well, he's still like, hey, you know, we got to go back to the drawing board and, you know, I didn't do this well. we got to work on this and we got to play better as a team. I think it pisses people off because they expected him to be flustered. And I think he, behind closed doors – uh, or inside his – I'm not saying he's flustered. Things do get to him, but I think it's more so it makes him sharpen his iron a little more to make him more competitive and get better than where people see his reaction as, well, he didn't get flustered about this. I mean, when you're playing the quarterback position, you 
everything is not going to go as planned. You got to be able to, uh, you know, change on the fly. You got to be able to not so um, be flustered. You got to be able to move in the pocket and, okay, that wasn't so clean. I'm going to help that out. I get the ball off. Let's go to the next play. And I just think that's the way he kind of lives life. And I was joking with him the other day. Uh, I have six kids, and uh, they showed the um, on Twitter his kids coming out. And, you know, I think Abby has – calmed them down. I think the kids have calmed them down, having <laughs> the girls and uh, his little boy. You know, I think when you have kids uh, and you play the game that we play, I think after a while it's like what's really the, the – what really means the most to you. And, you know, I, I just remember playing, no matter how bad your day is, when he go home, those girls and his little man, he's the greatest thing no matter how bad he played. He's the greatest somebody, like he's Superman when he go home. I think you begin to understand that and you you kind of, you don't take things as as heavy as you used to. You know, the game is a hard game by itself. You don't add, if you don't add any other, uh, you know, things to it, I think it's hard enough. And I just think that's just been him. And I think that's what has made him so great is he has a short memory uh, he's going to attack the problem that's at hand, and he's going to find a way to get better. And I, I think uh, you're going to see him do the same thing in whatever venture he goes to uh, outside of football now. Well, and Michael, what you're talking about is really the support system around the player, whether it's on or off the field, is so important to the success of that individual. And before we let you go, earlier you were talking about Eli relying on tight ends and wide receivers. Well, in order to get those players to perform at a high level, they're going to be relying on assistant coaches who you also have connections to because when you look at this Giants coaching staff, Michael, it's the who's who of that 2016 Cowboys coaching staff, it seems. Mark Colombo you were with. He's now the Giants offensive line coach. Derek Dooley, who was the former Cowboys wide receivers coach, he's also on Joe Judge's staff. What was it like working with Colombo and Dooley and getting to know them and what you think they're going to provide for not just Jason Garrett but also Joe Judge, who is a first-time NFL head coach? Um, I think they're going to provide comfort. Um, coach Dooley, uh, he was my receivers coach when I played, and then I had the opportunity to sit in on meetings and kind of work with him when I um, was coaching there. Uh, Mark Colombo played, and then I got the opportunity to work with him I think he was an assistant or line coach at the time. They're going to provide comfort because Mark played the position as well as um, he's coached the position. So he's going to take pressure off there because he he's going to get those guys ready and he knows what they're going through. You know, it, it's not going to be too much that he can't um, personally tell them about or personally somebody he knows uh, to chime in on it. And then Coach Dooley the same. Uh, I think it's going to be a good – I think he has a very good staff, and then it's also providing him a great bubble to being a first-time head coach. You have a guy who's been a head coach. Uh, coach Dula has been a head coach at um, the Tennessee Vols. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I want to say maybe La Tech, he was the head coach. Um, then you have Coach Jason Gary has been a long-time head coach with the Cowboys. So having all that extra knowledge, it helps. Mark Colombo has been in the system uh, with the Cowboys as a player as well as a coach. So I think all those guys are going to uh, be – they're going to make him his job a lot easier. But at the same time, those guys are going to be prepared to where um, it's going to also give him the opportunity to – you can just be a head coach. You can put your uh, things that you love in and things that, hey, I, these are some things that are non-negotiable I want done. But at the same time – He's going to be able to rely on them. Hey, I've never been through this. What do you think about this? And I think it's going to make them have a really, really good season. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm excited to see it. I'm, I'm happy for those guys because uh, I tell anybody, 2016 was a special year. We didn't get the outcome that we wanted. But, um, I mean, it was awesome to see those guys work behind the scenes because you, as a player, I never knew how much time is put in. Uh, by the coaches they're there before you get there they're there after you get there uh they, they're doing the time you're there and then the days that you're off they're still at work you know when you get vacation they're still at work so um I my hat goes off to I never thought I would ever be a coach but being there and kind of
kind of put my feet in the fire and just kind of get an opportunity to see how it works. I think it's a blessing uh, to have that opportunity in 2016. And I think Coach Judd, I mean, he's hired him. He's going to realize how much of a blessing they are to him because uh, those are great guys, to, great guys to work for. But also those are some really intelligent guys. and They've been in the business as long as they have for a reason. So it's going to be awesome. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing it.